I learned it from the ground up. I left school and took a year off. I was hanging off the side of the accommodation building in uh, in high seas and trying to, uh, to to paint the side of a ship. Ironically, a lot of the effects from the pandemic in 2020, even with lockdowns and these things, were reversed and it produced, I think, a better market than most people expected. We have the biggest ships in the world with cranes. We ship uh, more than 100 different uh, cargoes per year. If you took a heat map of the globe, the trading pattern of our ships looks like a children's drawing. We get many questions asking you about this technology shift. Have you seen anything that makes you excited? I'm absolutely sure the shipping market adapts and you get a constant development of new technology. And then I'm a bit afraid that it's going a bit slow on the regulatory side. So how early did you get an interest in the ocean or the maritime industry? How early did it start? Uh, that started uh, that started from childhood actually. I, I grew up in the US and uh, in, the, in the 80s there were a lot of Norwegians uh, based in the US uh, who worked in shipping. So um, even though my family was not involved, uh, I, I, I got an interest into it from uh, meeting uh, people in the neighborhood and friends of our family who, who told all these uh, exciting stories and fascinating uh, experiences from from the shipping market and, and the shipping business. And then it was uh, until later uh, when I was uh, in, in school, I was, I was a restless kid uh, and uh, I actually took a year off from, uh, from high school. Uh, which was a bit unusual. Um, so actually, uh, I left school and took a year off. And during that year, I got the chance to sail on a tanker vessel uh, for a few months uh, as a normal part of the deck crew. And uh, I remember when I came back after a, a, a few months, uh, I was really uh, bit by uh, uh, the industry. So uh, you could say from the age of 16, 17, I was I was determined to either uh, become a, the dream was to either become a ship captain or work with a ship owner. So that sparked, uh, sparked the interest. Where did the tanker operate? Which routes did you participate on? That was uh, an Aframax tanker uh, owned by uh, the uh, Ugla Nordic. Um, and uh, it was a 110,000 deadweight ship and it sailed uh, all across uh, Europe. Um, and uh, yeah, from Spain to UK, Rotterdam, Norway, uh, quite intense uh, trade. Uh, but for a 17 year old, uh, I was picking rust and painting and it gave me the chance to, uh, to reflect. And for me, uh, it, it was a good way of uh, focusing uh, on something else in school. So when I came back, I had, um, I had a plan on what I wanted to do later in life. And that helped me a lot to, to finish school in the end and it also sparked the, the interest to the maritime industry. Isn't it also fascinating to, to sort of also reflect on the perspective and experience you get from actually being out there exploring the oceans? Because when you're kind of working corporate, you can sort of think about it, reflect on it, but you haven't really been there to totally understand how it is to operate on that vessel, you know? Yeah, that's true. And, and uh, you, uh, I learned it from the ground up. Uh, I was hanging off the side of the accommodation building in, uh, in high seas and trying to, uh, to, to paint the side of a ship. Uh, I spent a lot of time, uh, I really got to know the crew uh, I, I sailed with. Um, so I think later on, uh, uh, after I finished school and, and uh, I also joined the Navy and I started working as a ship broker, um, I think I always have that sense in the back of my head that I, I've been on board a ship, I know what it feels like. And, um, yeah, I have a deep uh, affection for, for the ocean and, and the shipping business. Take us over to the experience studying in, in Liverpool. How did you end up there and wasn't it an easy choice to go to UK for studies? Uh, yes and no. I think, uh, as I said, I, was, I wasn't too motivated to go to school. So when I was, when I was uh, um, uh, making a plan to, uh, to, to figure out how to get into shipping, uh, I needed to get a degree from university. Um, and I got a good advice actually at early age because I was so determined on, on going into the shipping industry and uh, a friend of our family said, if you're so determined on that, you should study something more um, generic uh, and versatile because if your plan A doesn't work out, uh, you might as well have an education you can use for something else. I ended up studying macroeconomics. Um, but the list of universities I applied to, they were all by the sea and they were all former ports. 
So uh, Liverpool uh, was uh, being uh, uh, one of the big ports uh, uh, in the in the shipping uh, world, uh, kind of uh, ticked the boxes. What's the best part of, of uh, living in Liverpool and experiences in the UK? That was the, the culture and music scene, I would say, number one. It's a very vibrant city. Uh, it's also, of course, known for the football. Uh, um, and it has this, um, I don't know, it has this pulse, uh, which is quite uh, special there. And um, they were through a rough uh, uh, patch in the 80s and the 90s. So when I was there in... I moved there in 2001. Uh, they were really uh, going through a lot of positive development. So it was every time I was back uh, in Norway for a, for a summer holiday or or a winter vacation, and I came back, there was always something new development going on in the city. So uh, I really really enjoyed the, the the people there, the the spirit of the city, and the kind of uh, um, yeah, they they are extremely passionate people. Definitely. And also, when you're talking about shipping, there is something to be said with the the greatness of having you know an international network and sort of understanding how the world ticks, right? So, in hindsight, how great is it to have you know that experience of being abroad, getting an international network, etc., when you're then afterwards working in shipping? Yeah, that was a great. Uh, it was a great experience for me. I mean, as I said earlier, I was a, uh, I was uh, not so motivated and restless uh, in school, so. I think that's uh, uh, probably the biggest advantage for uh, for a, uh, for youth today is if they get the experience and the chance to uh, figure out what their interests are because you you go through school and then suddenly you're 18 19 and it's really a tough task to start figuring out uh, what what your opportunities in life are so for me um actually uh, dropping out of school and, and taking time off and then by chance getting the opportunity to sail on board a vessel suddenly that fueled me with a, um, a plan and determination in life which which I think compensated for uh, the lack of determination in school um, so uh, that uh, combined with uh, the, the mandatory military service you have uh, in Norway it, uh, it gives people a um, the chance to actually figure out what uh, what what your talents are or your passions and uh, yeah for me um, that was uh, really important. And how was how was the segue from the university over to to Fernley's on the broker side? Was it started with an internship and then you got an opportunity, or was it something else that made that possible to jump over to the broker side? Which I guess was your initial hope and dream, I guess. Yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, I was very. I was very determined to try and get a foot inside. So uh, already in uh, in the first year of uh, university, I was starting to write letters around to shipping companies and broker um, broker houses to try and get a, a, an internship. And uh, in those days, uh, uh, you could send an email, but I actually went personally around and delivered the letter in the reception of a lot of shipping companies. Um, and I figured out the best way for me to compete with. Uh, straight A students from the university was that uh, I knew what I was uh, wanting to work with. Um, so by uh, the last summer of university, I was lucky to get an internship with Fernleys. And, uh, and that really uh, started my, uh, my career in, uh, in, uh, as a professional. So I finished uh, an internship of a couple of months. And uh, a few months later, they called me and asked if I wanted to come back full time after I finished studies. So that was um, that was something really which happened before I, I, I finished university. I had I had uh, a, a job with uh, with Fernies as as a trainee ship broker, and um, yeah, from there on uh, I uh, I was uh, I was in. So. Um, um, but it was certainly the uh, the internship which uh, which uh, which opened it up for me. What would you say is the toolkit you get from working in a company like Fernleys? I guess you, I guess you get exposed to a lot of deals, a lot of activity all the time. So how would you describe the toolkit you sort of gather after after a couple of years of working working there? Uh, broking is uh, is uh, is a great place to start uh, in, in in shipping because at a, at a young age you get uh, exposed uh, and you meet a lot of people in the industry 
um, and you you get to join uh, older colleagues when when they meet uh, a lot of their clients. So, you know, even I was 22 when I started with Fernies, and and already in my first year, I, I met a lot of exciting uh, Norwegian and, and foreign shipping companies, and you get exposed very quickly to uh, how the business is actually uh, set up. Um, you also get a big challenge because as a broker, you, you have to be competitive and you have to kind of, uh, uh, you have to create your own uh, success in a way um, uh, after a few years. Uh, so uh, it's, it's the mix of, of being exposed early, giving, being given a lot of opportunities. Uh, Fernie is, uh, is, is, is one of the best places uh, you can possibly start. They have a 150 year long history in the business. So when you're a young uh, person and you, you, you're trying to uh, develop a career, um, having a company like that uh, opens a lot of doors. So um, yeah, it was a perfect place for me to start. Um, but I was applying to lots of different shipping companies, and I was uh, I was uh, very pleased uh, when I got the chance there, and I, I actually stayed there almost ten years the first time. What do you think was the reason you stayed so long? Then was it because of the trajectory? You had so much fun because I guess like you touched upon it, you know, highly competitive environment. So you sort of need to be passionate about it to maybe excel at it because it's a twenty four seven job. Yeah, the reason I stayed for a long time is is uh, because of uh, the company, the opportunities, uh, good colleagues. Um, I also uh, I felt I had a lot of development there, and and time passed quickly. I mean, uh, I started the, uh, the the year I was uh, turning twenty three, um, and I uh, after a few years in in the chartering department, I moved to the S and P department, the sale and purchase of vessels. And every every time I met a client, or you know, in, in shipping, uh, one thing leads to another often, and that's that's very true as a broker as well. One transaction leads to the next one. Um, so I really enjoyed the time there actually, and uh, uh, I could have stayed even longer as well. Um, but uh, but chances had it, I, I I had a chance after what was it? Uh, I was there nine years or so, and then I had the chance to join a smaller private ship owning company in Oslo, which uh, was also a, a dream uh, for a long time. So if interesting segue over to, to Bell Ships, because it's been quite a transition there, but how did that opportunity arise in the first place? When did it come up to your math that Bell Ships could be an opportunity for you to, to go over to? That was uh, also from Fernley's. Uh, I went back to Fernley's for a second time. Um, and I was working as a broker and advisor for, uh, for various uh, clients. And um, I was involved in the sidelines uh, in, the, in the transaction, which turned out to be the, the merger between Lighthouse and Bell Ships. And I, I really strongly believed in the case. And I remember after um, that transaction was, um, was done, um, I started buying shares as a private person. I really believed in, in the story and the company. And a half a year later, the new board uh, called me and, uh, and asked for uh, uh, a conversation. And they presented the opportunity to, to assume uh, the role of CEO. So for me, it was um, in a way a long uh, process because I was involved in, a, in, a, in, a, in the transaction. And then in a way for me, a, a perfect uh, ending and opportunity uh, to join afterwards. So um, yeah, that's how it happened. I, I got to know uh, the people uh, and the company during that process. And then yeah, half a year later, the, uh, the phone came and um, it was a relatively uh, easy thing to say yes to. A big challenge, but uh, a very fun one as well. Talking about the legacy of the company, because that is pretty long. I mean, started in the after, sort of after World War One, I, I guess. So just get, giving the, the legacy story of Bell Ships, it's, uh, it's quite an interesting story. It's been here for a long time. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a fascinating story. Uh, the company turned uh, 100 years uh, a few years back, which is, is no small feat for a shipping company. And it's also an example of uh, the cyclical nature of a shipping business. You have to survive uh, peaks and troughs uh, uh, wars um, and uh, the the history of Bell Ships uh, really started with uh, a fascinating piece of innovation because 
uh, at the time you had general cargo ships uh, sailing around um, and, and, uh, and, and shipping general cargo. And the uh, founder of L-Ships, he um, came up with an idea to create the first uh, heavy lift vessels in the world, actually, to transport uh, locomotives uh, and railway equipment on deck. And that was the business for the first uh, decades. And then the company has been through tanker, uh, bulkers. Uh, they've been involved in uh, the, the most segments uh, you can think of. And uh, but there's also been a constant for um, yeah about three generations, uh, call it uh, since since the 1930s actually. One family through three generations has been involved in the company, so it's 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 a rarity in shipping, uh, and it's one of the the, the longest uh, the listed companies in Oslo um, since the mid 1930s fascinating story people should definitely check that out i mean there's a great timeline on your web page as well giving all the, the different shifts in the in the business i guess so once you, you 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 took over you said you had a personal strong conviction of the company based on the acquisition and merger can you care to explain what made you so optimistic was it is was it because it was a perfect fit merging those two companies and that you saw this is a great platform to grow further because if you look at the last couple of years it's been a very impressive transition. I mean, a lot of business has been done over those years. So what do you think, what was the, the pitch that made you so interested in, in, in taking lead on that? It, it, it was a fantastic platform to build uh, uh, the company on. Um, you know, a hundred years of history. Uh, they had the listing uh, in Oslo on the main um, stock exchange in Oslo. Um, they had a, a, a fleet of uh, bulk carriers, uh, seven ships at the time. Um, but the merger with Lighthouse transformed the company because uh, the, the fleet doubled uh, to, uh, to, to 16 ships. Uh, but it also uh, brought on board uh, Lighthouse Navigation, which is our commercial and, and, and operating platform. So it transitioned the, the, the company into a, a possible uh, growth story. So. The unique part of uh, uh, of bell ships at that time was that you had you had a listing, you had a hundred years of history, so you had a strong uh, brand name. Um, bell ships is one of the the companies who first started contracting ships in in Japan, and you can trace it back to the late seventies. Um, that's also a unique part of uh, our, our company uh, today. Um, that gave us an edge in in in, uh, in financing. And then, um, you know, with the, with, the, the, with the merger, the market cap of the company uh, went from $30 million uh, to about $100 million. So what appealed to me was this was a chance to, to, to take a great uh, company, uh, a great name, and uh, try and make it more uh, relevant for the wider uh, investor uh, market, uh, retail investors, make it investable, Make it relevant for uh, for a wider audience uh, and see where we can uh, where we can take it and and that was really what appealed to me the um, the chance to uh, to uh, to uh, to rejuvenate and and and, um, and be part of this uh, growth uh, story which it uh, happily has become. Definitely, I mean, last year was I guess exceptional. How would you summarize the last year in terms of the rates, etc.? It seems like it has been a very good year. And to, obviously, if you're going to talk about market, how has the transition been to this year? How, how has the change, the narrative on the market, etc.? Well, over the past three years, uh, it's been a it's been a it's been a tremendous uh, eventful period of time uh, where uh, the the market has has showed uh, its cyclical nature. Uh, there's been a lot of unexpected uh, surprises, both positive and negative. Um, I think last year was uh, overall obviously an extremely strong year. Um, I mean, we made uh, we made more money last year than our market cap was four years ago. And that's obviously because of a strong market, but also the exceptional growth uh, we've been through. Uh, but last year was, was uh, extremely... Um, uh, it was extremely strong and, and you know, coming out of a pandemic, uh, the bulk market was uh, proved to be really resilient and, and already in, from the summer in 2020, the market uh, started improving. So uh, into last year, we had uh, 
a lot of new ships coming in, uh, which we had uh, acquired. And, and the market basically, uh, for almost uh, all of the year, uh, was on an upward trend. Um, and uh, ironically, a lot of the effects from the pandemic in 2020, even with lockdowns and these things, were reversed and it, it came together and, and produced, I think, a better market than most people expected. Another late day at the office, busy with dial-up earnings calls, buried in annual reports, transcripts, and... Wait, what? There's an app for that? Good morning, everyone. We are glad you can join us for Quarter is the world's fastest growing investor relations app. With Quarter in your hand, you get frictionless access to earnings reports, slide decks, earnings calls, and transcripts literally anywhere in the world. Visit your app store of choice and download Quarter today. And the best part, it's 100% free. And how does that feel to sitting here today? I mean, people are starting to get a bit bearish on the economy in general. People seem a bit uncertain. How is your macro view right now on, and also on the years going, going on right now? Do you feel bearish or do you feel like there is still room to grow in the market? Uh, that's a good question. And uh, that's one of the fascinating thing, things about shipping because it's so integrated in the, in the, in the global uh, economy and it really fuels uh, world GDP. Uh, or you can turn around and say, well, GDP fuels uh, shipping. So uh, with uh, the inflationary pressures now and uh, recession fears, uh, shipping is an interesting place uh, to follow because it's, it's, um, it's so interconnected with how the trade flows and how the global uh, economy uh, is going. And right now, um, we do see that uh, the rising inflation and increasing interest rates are... Um, increasing the, the chances of a, a possible uh, recession. And uh, I think for, for shipping, it's about managing uh, these uh, cycles. And they can be short and they can be longer. And it's very difficult to predict uh, the demand side uh, because it's so uh, varied. Um, you know, the biggest factors in the dry bulk market, uh, if you want to single them out, is the Chinese economy being the biggest demand source for the shipping market or the dry bulk market, uh, and also INR. And both of those are currently um, um, a bit uncertain with, with the lockdown in, in China, uh, and also uh, less than normal INR uh, coming out of Brazil. Um, for us, we've, uh, uh, we've actually been quite bullish for the last couple of years and felt it was a good point in the cycle to build up a company and, and expand the fleet. Uh, from last year, uh, around uh, the autumn, we, we changed subtly a bit tech. Uh, so we, we started uh, chartering out uh, a lot of our ships for one and two years. And we've been doing that for the past six to nine months. Uh, so I think maybe a bit differently from, uh, from other uh, listed companies, we actually have quite a bit of charter uh, coverage uh, right now. So for the rest of this year, we, we basically have 70 to 80% already covered. And, and, and for next year, we have about half of the fleet covered. So we, um, we felt like the risk reward to charter out the ships and, and, and take down a bit of the uh, market exposure uh, has been prudent. And then I think uh, whether there is a recession or not, that uh, remains to be seen. It's, uh, I think it's uh, very difficult to predict uh, when uh, that's going to happen. People tend to uh be wrong about those things um uh, certainly with the timing for it so uh, i think for us we've uh we've taken a bit more prudent stance on on short-term market developments over the past half year so i think we're in a pretty good position now where uh, where uh, the, most of our um, our fleet is covered uh for the rest of the year and we uh we can uh, we can have a pretty constructive view of dry bulk uh, supply and demand over the next, let's say, two, three years, because the supply of new ships is steadily decreasing. So I think for, uh, for dry bulk, uh, I think we're, uh, we're approaching a supply um, situation, which hasn't been, been, uh, been seen in uh, yeah, more than uh, 20 years. It's approaching three decades since the last time we had so few new ships coming into the market. Um, and also when you have when you have inflation, uh, shipping is actually a not a bad place to be invested because we have hard assets 
and uh, and uh, and that uh, that uh, appreciates if you have uh, inflation in in the economy. Good answer. Just taking maybe maybe a basic question because some people, especially from the international audience, you know, like to compare all dry bulk companies with each other. And but the interesting part here is that there are smaller vessels, which I guess also gives more optionality based on maybe a, a large vessel who basically only is driven by iron ore demand. So how would you summarize sort of the different type of fleet Bell Ship has compared to other shipping companies who are also in the dry bulk space? Yeah, the simplest way I can uh, I, t I usually explain it is that uh, we have the biggest ships in the world with cranes, and and we use cranes to discharge and load the cargo, and um, and our ships go up uh, all rivers and and deltas around the globe. Uh, they're extremely versatile. We uh, we ship uh, more than a hundred different uh, cargoes per year, um, and if you look over the past three uh, or even ten years, um, the segment of supermax and ultramax is. Uh, have actually done the best. And every time you have a downturn, uh, they outperform every single other uh, dry bulk segment. But basically, uh, they're the biggest ships with 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 cranes. And then if you uh, look at, for example, Cape Size and Newcastle Maxes, they're the biggest ships without cranes. And to put it in simple terms, uh, for me, it's it's important in shipping to, uh, to invest on the same side of uh, economy of scale. So you want the biggest ships within each uh, cargo or, or trade flow, uh, and uh, and we're in uh, the one of the two biggest ones, which is the the geared segment. And what you tend to see when there are uh, uncertainties with with one cargo or one export, uh, for example, now with uh, with the tragic situation in in Ukraine, um, there are question marks over over wheat exports. Um, you have uh, rain and flooding in Australia, so you have question marks over coal exports. Uh, in Brazil, you've, uh, you have iron ore. And what happens is that the, the ships who rely on one or two cargoes only, they tend to uh, be more volatile, whereas our ships, they find other cargoes. And, and we trade, if you, if you took a heat map of the globe, uh, the trading pattern of our ships looks like a children's drawing. So it's it's more versatile and it's more uh, protected uh, to to um, uh, to shortfalls in one area or one uh, cargo. Is it fair to say that it, this setup can also take advantage of sort of the the problems we have seen in container markets as well, because you are so versatile, or not at all? Yeah, the, there is the interconnection there, and uh, ever since the the container market uh, started uh, uh, booming uh, a while back, you see a small portion of of uh, previously containerized cargo uh, moving and then being shipped with uh, with uh, with one of our ships. So that's um, that's certainly part of the the, the demand mix, and uh, that's helped also uh, strengthen the, the dry bulk market. So. Uh, you had uh, congestion in most of the ports in the world has just been increasing over the past three, four years, actually before the pandemic started. Um, you have containerized cargoes to some extent being shifted into uh, bulk carriers like ours. And that, that certainly, um, uh, certainly, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, aids uh, the demand uh, for our ships as well. You see, you see metals, uh, certain wood products, um, bagged cargoes like uh, fertilizers. These can easily be shipped in a container and they're being shipped in a bulk carrier instead. What has been the biggest surprise for you so far this year in terms of the cargo and trade patterns, If you, besides the war maybe? But, but maybe it's also the consequences of it, I guess. Yeah, again, this year is uh, who would have uh, predicted the, uh, the the story of this year. So you have you have, um, you have uh, the situation in Ukraine, um, but also significantly for our market, China is is actually going uh, uh, through a, a lockdown uh, again. <clears throat> and I think uh, there's also been uh, perhaps a, a, a negative uh, surprise so far on, on iron ore uh, shipments uh, from South America. Um, but uh, again, our, our segment has, has fared extremely well uh, all year. Uh, and, and it's another example of how, uh, how stable and, and strong uh, the, the earnings have been. So. I think for most uh, most part of this year, it's been the strongest uh, 
uh, performing segment, uh, and it still has the highest rates uh, if you follow the daily spot uh, measurements uh, from the Baltic index. If you look at, if you going to touch upon finance lessons, because you've been acquiring so many vessels, sold many. What's been the biggest lessons from a financing perspective? Because at least from the outside, it seems like that's been very well done. The financing part over these last couple of years has been so hectic, gets so many deals done. What's been your takeaway from doing all this acquiring and how important finance, the, the right financing has been? And what is the right financing also? Yeah, to, uh, financing is such an integrated part of of of, uh, of ship owning investments. Um, <clears throat> apart from the technical and operational side, uh, the financing is really what uh, makes or breaks it in in uh, in shipping. And and of course you can you can uh, you can time the cycle and buy ships cheap uh, ships cheap. Uh, sorry, and and ex sell them expensive. But <clears throat> but over time, uh, financing is is the clue. And for us. We have um, we set us up uh, uh, using the the Japanese leasing market, which uh, enabled us to finance uh, very modern ships, brand new ships, uh, for periods of uh, around ten years with fixed interest rates. So uh, we started doing this already uh, three years ago uh, when we started buying ships. We sold them to Japanese finance uh, leasing companies, and we charter them back for, uh, on average, periods of eight to 10 years. Um, the advantages of that are several. Uh, first, we, we get fixed interest rates for the entire period, which you see uh, the benefit of today with, with inflation and, and, uh, and rising interest rates and financing costs. Uh, you also have a duration of, of uh, basically twice of what you get from the normal uh, banking or bond market uh, here in Europe and the US. So you have a longer uh, tenor. Um, and then uh, for us, it's also been a way to, uh, to, uh, to approach the green shift because we've, we've essentially sold our ships to, um, uh, to a structure where we uh, have control of it for, for a period of 10 years, let's say on average up to 2027 to 2030. Um, and during this period, we have options to repurchase the vessels, uh, but at the end, we're not obliged to uh, purchase the vessel. So, you know, with over the next five years, uh, a lot of things can happen in, uh, with technology, uh, propulsion system, fuels, and all these things. So instead of uh, be sitting with old ships, and doing nothing, or moving too quickly and and building more ships with nobody needs, which are only marginally better than yesterday's ships, we approached it a bit more financially. So, with seventy five uh, percent of our ships financed this way, we can actually turn around the company uh, one hundred and eighty degrees um, when we approach uh, new technology and and be a bit more agnostic. Uh, so our our take on this was competitive financing, but basically having uh, the, the best ships available today, I think is a good solution. Um, and then we can see what happens uh, later in the decade. Um, and and we, re we finished last year selling uh, all our so-called non-eco ships. So I think we uh, we completed one of the quickest uh, modernization turnarounds of a fleet. Um, uh, so we don't have any so-called non-eco vessels. Um, and the vessels we have today are, are what you could say are the top 10 percentile in terms of efficiency. Um, but we expect that the, the things might look different in 2025 to 2030. Uh, and so we've taken a financial approach to that. Interesting. So you touched upon risk several times and you also, you know, touched upon new technology, etc. We got many questions asking you about this technology shift. Have you seen anything that makes you excited or is it too early to say which technology is going to be the right one for the next decades ahead? I think there's there's lots to be uh, to be excited about, and I, I think uh, uh, one of the greatest uh, traits about shipping is how resilient and adaptive um, and uh, you have uh, uh, thousands of ship owning companies in the world who are willing to invest in this and put risk capital 
uh, behind what essentially moves 90% of all raw materials and goods in the world. And this is, this is an extremely adaptive uh, market. Um, and I think for, for technology, uh, uh, I think the, 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 that's the positive part. Uh, and then I think the, what disappoints me is that how long it takes to get uh, uh, legislation and, and policies from IMO uh, to be truly global. Now you see kind of your, the EU moving uh, quicker in one direction. But shipping is a global market, so we need uh, universal regulation and hopefully uh, speedy regulation because it impacts so huge amounts of investments. So uh, I'm excited about the future because I'm absolutely sure the shipping market adapts and you get a constant development of new technology. And then I'm uh, a bit afraid that it's going a bit slow on the regulatory side uh, and that it's... Uh, uh, previous examples have shown that it uh, it takes often five or ten or fifteen years to become ratified by all flag states and regulatory bodies. So, um, yeah, maybe this is also probably the, the main reason why why the order book is so low, right? People are a bit, you know, afraid of what making the wrong investment today may be a very bad choice if you suddenly have this new technology shift or hard regulations, right? So. How hard has this played on the order book in general that people are a bit, you know, confused about what would be the right technology going forward? Yeah, and that's <clears throat> that's probably the best proposition about uh, looking at the dry bulk market today is that the, since uh, the, actually a few years back, uh, there's been a steady decline of new orders relative to the sailing fleet. And the longer the market in general uh, abstains from running and ordering new ships which are equal or only marginally better than uh, today's ships, uh, the better. Uh, it's better for the environment uh, and it's better for the investors. Um, there are no new ships today you can contract which really uh, changes the environmental uh, footprint in a big way because the, the ship you're selling most probably ends up owned by somebody else. You contract a new one and uh, you see a few percentages uh, improved efficiency, but there is there is not a huge um, improvement yet in, in terms of propulsion and fuels. So I think uh, for, for us uh, and for me, uh, my belief is that uh, having the most modern ships there are today, uh, they carry 10 to 20 percent uh, more cargo than ships which are 15 years old. Uh, they uh, they consume uh, uh, 10 to 20 percent less fuel, and that's a huge uh, efficiency improvement. Um, uh, but uh, the the order book in, in in general has also been helped by other segments. Uh, rushing to yards and, 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 and filling up shipyards with orders for container ships, uh, LNG carriers and other segments. So for dry bulk, that's been uh, a blessing in a way because uh, historically um, uh, companies have been a bit too quick. Uh, if you have a strong market, uh, the order book tends to, uh, to be inflated and then you get a double uh, whammy afterwards <clears throat> with unfortunately too many ships. So uh, I think that's the probably the best uh, silver lining actually for uh, for dry bulk investors today. Another question we got quite quite a lot was the, the dividend policy. A lot of people are interested in that. Just from like a, a bird's eye view, how do you create the dividend policy, and what is from your perspective the right dividend policy for bell ships, and what are the trade offs if you look at the debt versus you know paying out more dividends? Because it seems like in shipping. Dividend policy is something that gets people very in interested to understanding. So, what's been the philosophy behind your dividend strategy? Uh, no dividend. Uh, dividend policy is uh, is important for uh, for any shipping company um, or most shipping companies. For us, um, we were uh, we were through a, a very active period of growth for uh, for about two years, and then uh, we were ready to announce a dividend policy, which we did. Uh, a year ago, and um, uh, 
we basically say that we're going to pay out uh, 50% of our net result. Uh, keep it simple and the policy we can uh, live with and perform uh, in the long term. Um, so that's been running for, uh, for, for a year now and, and we paid out four quarters since that. Um, we've actually paid out more than 50% if you look at what uh, the actual uh, decision uh, the, the board has made each and every quarter. So in total, we paid out more than four kroners uh, in total uh, per share over the past four uh, quarters. And that's, that's approaching the, the same value uh, of what the company as a whole was worth uh, four years ago. So I think um, we found a balance where we've been able to grow the company, expand the fleet. Um, we, uh, we announced a dividend policy while we were still growing uh, in terms of number of ships which I think is evidence that we had a prudent financing plan. So we didn't have to wait to get all ships delivered and, and, uh, and kind of the growth period uh, ending. Um, we started paying out dividends. And I think uh, 50% uh, is, is easy to understand. Um, and also it was reflective upon that uh, we had good use uh, of the remaining 50%. So of all companies' earnings, you can, you can keep it or you can pay it out to investors. But there's no point paying out investors 100% if you can uh, provide them with a, a better return by investing uh, the capital, actually. So we hadn't run out of ideas uh, when we announced uh, the dividend policy. Um, and I think we've shown afterwards that the return on capital uh, for a Bell Ships investor uh, has been uh, relatively strong uh, compared uh, by just paying it out. And we've created a total return in terms of an increasing share price. Um, as I said, the, uh, the dividend uh, has been actually, in, in, in practice, it's been a bit more than 50%. Um, and we have a good uh, runway ahead where we, we're, with the period contract coverage we have today, uh, we're quite comfortable uh, saying that we're going to continue to pay out uh, a minimum 50% of net earnings. If you look at the next couple of years, what do you hope is going to be the story and narrative about Bell Ships the next two, three years? Because obviously this growth story has been phenomenal, right? But is it a matter of becoming more like a value type of stock right now? Or do you want to keep growing? What sort of division you see for the company the next two, three years? What do you hope the story will be? Uh, that's a good question, and I think uh, we were very outspoken that the uh, number one priority three years ago was to grow, uh, and that, that had several reasons behind it. It was not only the market, which we felt was a favorable time to, to both grow and, and modernize the fleet, um, but it was also driven by uh, uh, you need a certain scale to get competitive financing and, uh, and also to be relevant uh, as a listed company. Um, I feel uh, sometime last year we, we, we ticked the boxes of, of critical mass and, and necessary fleet size. So we, we're, not a, we're not a shipping company which uh, has a number uh, of fl uh, fleet growth in mind for the next three years. We don't, we don't have to expand uh, to, to keep our business. Uh, we're quite happy with the size we have today and I'd say probably the number one priority now is, 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 uh, is the dividend capacity. So we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't uh, prioritize growth uh, the next uh, year. Uh, I would say over dividend capacity. Interesting. Just a, a couple of more questions left. Uh, we have so many listeners who would like to have a career in shipping, etc. And I see that you have been, you know, had some recent job positions open. So just curious, from a perspective of. What are you looking for when you're hiring these roles you have been doing recently? And I think you have one available right now as well, a new position in the company. What do you typically look for when hiring and setting the right culture? Because as a leader, I guess you're responsible for the culture you want to have in the company as well. So what's been your perspective on leadership and hiring, recruiting, etc.? Uh, luckily, the, the, the culture in our company is a sum of the parts. Um, so... Um, I think, uh, uh, yeah, correct, both in, in, in Bell Ships and in Lighthouse Navigation. Uh, we've, uh, we've had the pleasure of hiring people over the last couple of years. Um, um, we're not a huge company in, in, in terms of people. 
Um, so I think it's uh, it's a great place uh, for uh, for opportunities in the sense that you get to be close to uh, actual operations or finance or chartering um, uh, in a shipping company. Um, and over the past uh, two three years, we've uh, we've also been lucky to to hire a lot of young people. So. Uh, there's not. I wouldn't say there's 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 not uh, one formula for this. I think uh, we uh, we've happily taken on people with less experience the last couple of years. So uh, we're not a shipping company who who uh, who um, uh, where it's impossible or difficult for for people without experience to have to have a chance. And um, yeah, we have a couple of ads out right now. So. Uh, I think uh, get in touch if you're interested, and you know I, I sometimes get emails from from students or young people interested in shipping, and I remember where I came from myself. So uh, I think sometimes you can give people a job, other times you can give them a phone call or a cup of coffee to to uh, to maybe uh, give them some pointers or ideas. Um, and that's uh, something we try to do, uh, even though we can't hire every good candidate to, uh, who, who chooses to apply. But um, yeah, so far we've been very fortunate and it's fun to see our offices in uh, both Singapore and Bangkok and Oslo, how vibrant and, and, uh, and uh, how they turned out over the past couple of years with uh, good people coming in and they create the culture. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not me. It's definitely a team effort. Just a last question. We, we usually ask people for their favorite books to share with the audience. What's been your favorite book you ever read that you can recommend to the audience? Oh, that's, that's both an easy one uh, and an obvious one for me. Uh, Animal Farm, George, uh, George Orwell. Uh, that can be read uh, several times. I, I, I usually read it once a year. Um, it's, it's, it's maybe one of the most brilliant books of all time. Uh, not only for the story, um, but it's also a, a masterpiece in in how to write a great book in a condensed. Uh, it's a very short book as well, and that suited me when I was uh, 15 and I didn't like school. So uh, easy choice. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, Lars Christian. It was a pleasure hosting you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me. Hi everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode and that you learned something new. If you like this content please make sure to subscribe to the channel. See you later.